Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend, as we honor those who have given their lives for the freedom of our country, help us to be people of freedom. And help us to recognize that you are the God, not only of our land, but of all nations. So open us now to hear your word, to receive what you have to offer to us, so that we may truly live as your people. Amen. Today is a Christian holiday. Today is called Trinity Sunday. How many knew that? That's what I thought. Every week, this Sunday, every year, the Sunday after Pentecost is Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday is a day to celebrate the fact that we Christians don't know how to do math. How many gods are there? How many persons are there? So what, three equals one. Doesn't add up. Now, this is only one of the many problems with our concept of the Trinity. So we're going to talk about it a bit today. How can one God exist as three persons? Well, first of all, some people are uncomfortable with the names. Well, who are the three persons of God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. Now, some people are uncomfortable with those names because Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that means that God is two-thirds masculine. Right? Man, father, son. Now, we know that's not true. Human categories like gender and race and all the rest, they just don't apply to God. So some people, though, argue that by calling God father and son puts women down. It makes it sound as though God favors men over women, which isn't true. But the reality is that this is how some people have applied the concept of God as father and son. So first of all, let's set that aside. God is neither male nor female. That just doesn't apply to him. We use the names father and son not to designate that God's a man, but for other reasons that we don't really have time to get into today. Now, some people have tried to avoid this by not calling God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and using other names for the three persons. Uh, some people, for example, will name them by their function and will say that the three persons of God are Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. The trouble is, according to the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all Creator. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in our redemption, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all sustaining our lives today. So that doesn't really work. By the way, speaking of the Bible, that is probably the biggest hurdle of all. Where in the Bible do we find the word Trinity? Exactly. Nowhere. The word Trinity is never named or even explained in the Bible. And so it's easier for people like the Jehovah's Witnesses to critique us on this point and say, well, why do you Christians believe in Trinity? It's not in the Bible anywhere. And on the one hand, they're right. But on the other hand, there are places in the Bible that give us the hint of God being Trinity. Uh, the closest we can get to are places like the New Testament reading that we just did, where Jesus said, I am in my Father. So the Son and the Father are united. And we also get the promise in the reading that Annette did for us, that the Father and the Son will send the Holy Spirit. So we hear about the three persons of the Trinity, and somehow have to make sense of that. There's another place in the Bible we get the hint of it. It's what's called the apostolic blessing in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, then you're probably familiar with me saying it at times. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we hear about the Trinity there. Another place is in Matthew chapter 3. As we hear about Jesus being baptized, we see all three persons of the Trinity there. Jesus, God the Son, comes out of the water, and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, and God the Father speaks and said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So how do you make sense out of these passages? They're all hints, but they help us think there's something about God here that is a little more complicated than what we can understand. So we've come up with the doctrine of the Trinity in order to help us understand what the Bible teaches us. But the Trinity is very easily misunderstood. Some people think that means we worship three gods instead of one god. And this can be particularly troublesome, say, for Jews and Muslims. 
Um, supposedly, Judaism and Christianity and Islam are what are called monotheistic faiths, that we believe there is one God. And Jews and Muslims really emphasize this. Uh, the Jewish faith can often be summed up in what's called the Shema, which is the first word in Hebrew of the statement. It's what we read together from the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And the Muslim faith is best summarized by the statement, there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. So Jews and Muslims can say, so what about you Christians? You talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you must believe in three gods. And we say, no, we believe in one God. Well, how do you explain Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Well, and then we all sort of stumble and stutter and shuffle our feet and hope someone changes the subject. And sometimes the way we change the subject is we engage in faulty theology. Sometimes we avoid dealing with Trinity um, by we say that we, we don't necessarily say it out loud, but the way we act, we act as though God the Father is the real God. The real God is God the Father. And God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they're just sort of the supporting cast for God the Father. So, after all, we say, if Jesus is the Son of God, then he's not really God, right? He's the Son of God. No. The Son of God is God the Son. Are you with me on that? Jesus is God. And the Bible is very clear about this. God the Son is not just sort of like God, but is fully God. Colossians chapter 2 tells us, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And Jesus himself makes it clear in John chapter 14 when he says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So God the Father, God the Son are the same. And, well, what about the Holy Spirit? Let's face it, sometimes we just sort of ignore the Holy Spirit, don't we? The Holy Spirit's just sort of out there somewhere. We think, well, the Holy Spirit, this is just sort of the presence of God with us. We forget that the Holy Spirit is a person and not an it. It's so easy when we talk about the Holy Spirit to say, oh, it fills us. No, the Holy Spirit isn't an it. Gary, are you an it? Becky, are you an it? No. You're a he, you're a she. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible lets us know the Holy Spirit acts, the Holy Spirit mourns, the Holy Spirit guides. These aren't things that objects, like a can of tuna. By the way, it's not tuna that you got, Gabriel. These are things that an object like a rock can't do. Now, there's one more problem we run into, or at least one more I'm going to talk about this morning, that we have to deal with when it comes to the Trinity. The Trinity is utterly unique. There is nothing else anywhere that is anything like the Trinity. And that makes sense because there is nothing like God. You cannot compare God to anyone or anything. But that doesn't stop us from trying to. Some people try to explain the Trinity by comparing it to other things. Like some people might say, well, the Trinity is like water. Because you could have water as ice or as liquid water or as vapor. No. That's not what the Trinity's like. Or people say, oh, well, the Trinity's like the sun, because the sun gives us light and heat and gravity. No, the, Holy, the Trinity is not like the sun. Or maybe the Holy Spirit is like a person, like me. I am a son, and I'm a brother, and I'm a husband all at the same time. So the Holy Spirit's like a person. No, that's not true either. Or on Memorial Day weekend, we could say, well, the Holy Spirit is like the United States of America because we're one country with 50 states. No, none of that works. The Holy Spirit is unlike anything you try to compare. I mean, the whole Trinity, see, now I'm getting confused. The Trinity is unlike anything that we could compare to. Several years ago, when I was a volunteer chaplain at Westminster Highlands, our church camp, which unfortunately is now closed, um, but several years ago when I was there, <clears throat> one of the third grade campers came up to me and asked me, can you explain the Trinity to me? Now, it's hard enough to explain the Trinity to an adult, so explaining it to a child is really tough. So, all right, so I stumbled along and I tried to do my best, and after a few minutes of hearing me struggle, the little boy asked me a question. So, 
I think what you're saying is that God is so powerful that he can be three people all at the same time. And I thought for a moment, I said, yeah, I think you just about got it right. In fact, a few months later, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with a prominent Presbyterian theologian, Andrew Purvis. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Purvis. So I just, by chance opportunity, had a few moments with Dr. Purvis. And I told him about this, what this young boy who said, that God is so powerful, he can be three people all at the same time. And he said, yeah, that's probably about the best explanation of the Trinity I've heard. Out of the mouths of babes, right? So, that's what... That's the best way to understand the Trinity. So let's look at it this way. Um, I am what makes me me, right? You are what makes you you. Now, what if the stuff that makes you you could make someone else you at the same time? Rose has a very puzzled look on her face, and my guess is that's what everyone else is feeling, but maybe is a little bit too polite. Not, you're very polite, Rose. Maybe you're like, oh, I don't want to say that. No, it's, a, it's hard for us to comprehend because it's impossible for us humans for someone else to have the same you-ness that you do. This is because we're trying to define a God who is beyond human comprehension. We can do our best to understand Trinity, but ultimately it is a mystery. And it is not a mystery to try to solve. It is a mystery to adore and to stand in awe and wonder of. So if the Trinity is such a complex topic to understand, why does it even matter? Here's one so what about the Trinity that makes all the difference for us. This is why God as Trinity really matters. The Trinity makes it possible for God to be love. And God, as love, makes love itself possible. If, in other words, if there was no trinity, there would be no love. Follow me on this. I think, I hope, you, would you all agree that God is love? You're with me on that so far, right? Okay, now, yeah, the Bible tells us love is the defining characteristic of God above all else. Now, love, by its very nature, needs an object to love. If you say, I love, you're always wondering, well, who do you love? What do you love? I love ice cream. I love my wife. I love, I don't know, whatever. You need something or someone to love in order to love, right? You can't just sit around and say, oh, I love. What do you love? Oh, nothing. I just love. It doesn't work that way. So, now we know that God loves us, right? I hope you know that. If you do not know that God loves you, please talk with me after worship. It is vitally important that you know that. God loves all people. God loves all of his creation. But what or who did God love before he created the world? There wasn't anything else out there for God to love, right? So if God is love and there's nothing to love, then how could God even exist? I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, well, God loved himself, but... Loving yourself, that's more like egotism than love, right? Here's the answer. This is what theologians call the inner life of the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit share the perfect relationship of love. The way Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to one another within the Trinity, this is the ultimate definition of what love is. They each honor and glorify and serve each other perfectly. And in doing so, they share a fellowship deeper than we could possibly imagine. For example, in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. That's a hint of what happens between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as they each honor and serve and glorify and lift one another up. Are you with me on this so far? Yes? No? Kind of. Okay, I'll take that as good enough. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share perfect love in honoring and glorifying and serving each other. The love that God shows to us is an outpouring or an overflow of the love that happens within the Trinity. Here's another way to look at it. 
First John chapter 4 tells us love comes from God. Right? With me on that. God's love makes our love for one another possible. If it wasn't for God's love in us, even if we don't know who God is, even people who don't acknowledge there is a God, their ability to love, our ability to love, comes from the fact that God first loves us. Without God's love for us, our ability to love one another would be impossible. And God's love for us is an overflow of the love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Without the love shared between the persons of the Trinity, any love at all would be impossible. So, why does our belief in God as a Trinity matter? It matters because it is what makes love possible. God's love for us and our love for one another. Yes, the Trinity is a mystery beyond what we can understand, but it is a mystery that we can praise and thank God for. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, receive the honor and the praise that we give to you as our reflection of the honor, love, and praise that exists within you. Amen.